All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Us in Flux Conversations. Us in Flux is a series of short stories and virtual gatherings that explore how we might reimagine and reorganize our communities in the face of transformative change. We published our first story of this 2022 season of Us in Flux in June, and we'll continue to publish one story a month and host one of these virtual events uh, each month through September. So we've just got one, one, one more left after this. Uh, you can read all the stories from 2022, as well as the 11 stories from our first season in 2020 at csi.asu.edu slash us in flux. And uh, the stories in this 2022 series all envision what we're calling civic experiments, considering the collective systems and activities that could power the inclusive thriving communities of the future. And uh, our story for August is uh, titled Sympathy, and it's by Sui Davies Okungboa, who we're delighted to have with us here today. Uh, it explores our hopes and anxieties about human robot interaction, the issue of dual use technologies that cross uh, over from military to civilian uh, contexts, the politics and economics of childcare, and the complexities and contested science of early childhood development, uh, which is a lot to imagine being uh, uh, fit into a flash fiction story of, of fewer than 3,000 words, but but it's been done. Um, so joining me today are, are two uh, amazing special guests. So first is um, Sui, and uh, Sui is an award-winning Nigerian author of fantasy and science fiction, and his latest books include the Nameless Republic epic fantasy trilogy, which includes um, the books Son of the Storm and Warrior of the Wind. Uh, he lives in Ontario, where he is a professor of creative writing at the University of Ottawa. And uh, thanks for being here uh, with us today. Uh, also joining us is Lance Garabi, an experimental artist and scholar, associate professor in the School of Film, Dance, and Theater, and an affiliated faculty in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. And uh, in addition to all of those uh, titles, Lance uh, also is an affiliate faculty at ASU's Center for Human, Artificial Intelligence, and Robot Teaming. Uh, he collaborates with transdisciplinary teams of artists, scientists, designers, and engineers to create innovative works of media-rich live performance, and his recent projects have involved robots, architectural projection, social media, and planetarium systems. And Lance has just helpfully cued me that he has received a promotion and is now a full professor. So strike that associate that shouldn't be there. Congratulations. Leveled all the way up. Right? It's just <laughs> downhill from here. <laughs> now you can really just relax. Just a, just a um, glide path to retirement. <laughs> Yeah, I could tell like having having like five titles at the university is a good way to do that right. Um, well, thanks for uh, to both of you for for being here today uh, and um, and thanks to everybody who's who's joining us in this session so um, we'll have some time at the end of the hour here for questions and comments from our audience, so you um, can use the Q and a button in your zoom window to submit those questions or or you can just drop comments uh, or thoughts in there and please do that anytime you don't have to wait uh, until the end of the session. Uh, if you drop them in now, we'll uh, turn to them uh, when we are near to the end of the hour. So, um, all right, well, without any further ado, and with all my throat clearing done, um, so you could you start us off by by telling us a little bit about uh, the story, Sympathy, and, and what inspired you to write it? Sure. Um, hi. Um, hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, so let's see. I, I think a story of this sort has sort of been like, percolating for me for a while. Um, and I would say three things really brought it together. The first was, um, so back a few years back, um, the, I think I, I would call it the biggest, if not the only speculative fiction, like online magazine on the African continent, right? It's called Omenana. Uh, and they've been running with, you know, they've been running for a while now, uh, but they did this special issue where they talked about like, positive futures, right, of um, that, uh, that are sort of, that are like, um, extrapolated from the African continent of a sort. Yeah. Um, and one of those was someone who put together a story about like robot nannies. And the reason they did that was because of how they thought about um, how community has sort of developed beyond the traditional family unit, or how it needs to develop beyond that, especially in a space as 
conservative as um, Nigeria, where I'm from, which is where the author was also from. Um, and so like the traditional family unit, um, especially when it comes to childcare, expanding beyond that to encompass, you know, community in a bigger sense, right? Um, both related by blood and not and stuff like that. And one of those was actually to include this robot because um, in that story, the robot was actually very protective of a family member who was uh, abusive toward the child, right? So there's this dynamic there about like who is more family, you know, or who's more community member in that sense. And it really got me thinking, right, about, yeah. what, you know, our, our interpretations of community and, and stuff like that. Um, and then earlier this year, um, uh, my spouse and I had welcomed our first child. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you. And and I guess we sort of dove into the deep end of like what we understood to be like the basis of like childcare and policies and things like that based on where we're from, which is Nigeria. But we live in Canada, which has its own, you know, you know, governance around childcare. Yeah. A lot of it was also very strange to me, right? Like um, the requirements around how you hire help if you do, um, what constitutes help and employment versus like what doesn't and all of that. So there was this, you know, area where we, you know, I started to think, I was like, if it wasn't a human person, right? Um, and if this was a, you know, a non-human person, would these laws still apply? You know, I started to think about that. Um, and then, of course, one of the big things was also the contentious debates around how your child should en engage with tech, technology, you know, yeah. digital engagement in general, when, uh, how much, and the science, you know, for basically we've heard from everyone from experts to anecdotes <laughs> from, you know, people who consider themselves experienced parents, and pretty much no one has anything concrete. It's all very like, Woo woo <laughs> and up in the air. So, so I guess those three things, you know, sort of came together in my mind because I started thinking about like what what does it mean, right? Um, what does it mean to have, you know, um, governance involved in your home in a way or in your own child's care? Uh, what what does the community do to pivot to sort of help that? Um, and then how how if we pull in, you know future technologies, you know, artificial intelligences into this mix, how do, you know, what role could they play? How will they function? How will they also be governed relative, you know, to community and stuff like, so that's pretty much how sympathy came together. Um, Cause I was really just thinking about um, um, all of those things. And, and of course, at the center of these things is like socioeconomic status, class and things mm -hmm. like that, money, the cost of childcare, things like that um who gets to afford to hire help and who can't and what what um what options they take what other options they take both those that are like um you know according to the book or those that are sort of like not uh, or are workarounds of policies and things like that um so yeah this story came about uh and i'm sure joey has already said but it's pretty much at the core it's a story about a community that attempts to help those who can't offer childcare by by taking their um, by taking um, what would ordinarily be security droids or or robots and c converting them to nannies so that people um, can sort of have a, a sort of reduced cost childcare or subsidized in a way, uh, but then it's it's at odds with the government policies who are trying hard to sort of, you know, under the guise of, you know, safety, right, but probably also other things. Um, so that's what the story is about at the core. Yeah, and I should say for folks that the protagonist or uh, vocalizer character of sympathy is a, a city inspector who is inspecting this childcare facility. And so it, it falls into this um, historical thread of science fiction of, of uh, it's a small, but like for us, a prize genre of like science fiction that's about regulation specifically yeah, and, and exactly. where the regulator becomes the character and, yeah. um, you know, walks the reader into the world and, and almost plays detective a little bit. You know, there's a very, very light, I think, yeah. uh, <laughs> that's on about in this story, uh, which I really like. Um, 
so Lance, I, you know, we, we, I, I immediately thought of you when I thought of this story, because I know you've done some work putting humans and robots together in creative contexts and in performance contexts. So I'm wondering how this story, you know, got you thinking about uh, the challenges related to humans working and living alongside robots in these like emotionally uh, demanding, phys you know, physically sophisticated and sort of intimate situations and like what kinds of issues that brings up. So I, I, I wonder what you made of the story as someone who's had to kind of grapple with, with this stuff in a different context. Yeah. Um, well, you know, there's a, there's a whole area within robotics, a whole sort of subfield within robotics called social robotics. Um, that is, that is all about uh, uh, looking at, at human robot interactions, uh, social, specifically social interactions. So they're the kind of thing that social robotics is interested in is how robots move, uh, uh, getting them to move in a way that, that doesn't seem robotic, uh, that seems fluid and natural, uh, uh, concerned with, with, uh, with the appearance, with the look of the robot, uh, uh, very interested in, in how uh, people respond to interactions with a robot in a, in a social situation, as opposed, and, and by social situation, I mean it's as opposed to being on the factory floor, for instance, or yeah. or in the in the laboratory or the uh, you know medical imaging, whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot of effort put into uh, what you might call or what I would probably call performance. Uh, how, does, how does the robot perform socially? And, you know, in this story, we have, we have some robots who, uh, whose primary purpose, uh, or I guess the story leaves it a little, there's, there's a little ambiguity or, or uh, it's, it's, it's uncovered that, uh, so the protagonist, uh, Sui, so will you correct me if I go wrong here? Okay. <laughs> um, that, that the protagonist uh, is, is under the impression that these security droids that are taking care of toddlers, uh, that their primary purpose is military, right? Yes, correct. He's, he's under that impression. But yeah. what, or, or she's under that impression. But what she discovers is, in fact, the, um, uh, the security a uh, uh, module or whatever it is in the story has been removed, um, uh, but that at its base level, uh, at, a, at a more fundamental level, the robot is trained or programmed to have social interactions and to be caring and, and nurturing, is that correct? Yeah, it's something of the sort, it's more like, um like apart from just the the reactionary right um approaches to um you know maybe um quelling violent situations or or responding to to crime or things like that which is what you know we usually think of when we think of you know something that's meant to secure right uh but what this what the programmer right or the engineer in this story tells or is trying to you know educate the inspector about is that at the base, these robots are not, you know, primarily designed for that, right? That's something that is is touted as one part of is one part of the programming that's touted, you know, the most. But at its core, these robots are actually, as you said, right, built for interaction. And a lot of the time, that interaction can be nurturing if you point it the right way or if you point it in the right direction, sort of. Um, and so, and so, pretty much, that's what the engineer is doing. Right, pretty much just pointing the programming in a very specific way that allows them to sort of become, you know, care robots as opposed to, you know, right. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's this idea uh, that the protagonist has that these are fundamentally violent uh, machines. Uh, and what she discovers is that, you no, know, fundamentally they are uh, social machines, uh, uh, interactive uh, caring, nurturing uh, machines, uh, especially now that they've had the, the, the security, the violent part module taken, taken out of them. Um, 
and 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 so uh, it, you know, it, it it made me think that um, you know we don't necessarily need our security robots, uh, our 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 violent. Uh, uh, you know, our, our agents of state violence um, to be uh, socially skilled. Um, uh, and, and certainly they, they don't have a great track record in that regard. Um, uh, so so it's, it's, it's interesting to know that beneath this, um, beneath what was, uh, you know, originally this uh, agent of state violence is this, in reality, this very nurturing, uh, you know, potentially social uh, creature. Uh, in in contrast to like, uh, do you know uh, Martha Wells' work, uh, the Murder Bot? Murder Bot, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And and this is a in, in there. This is a robot that doesn't have social skills. Um, uh, that is that is you know crippled by anxiety. Uh, as as it were, but um, so I I thought that was really uh, interesting, and the the problem in the story, as I understand it, or the pr problem for the protagonist, is uh, the protagonist has uh, a bias against these security robots. Um, I'll I'll use the word bias. I think it's I think she kind of gets yeah, triggered. That, that's correct actually. Yeah, yeah she, she has a, she, she has a gets, history with them. You know? yeah, yeah yeah so so she is uh has experienced trauma yeah. um at, at the hands of some security uh robots uh, just just like these so she is uh initially <laughs> uh more than wary of of the idea of these security uh, uh, robots caring for uh young children and so i wondered about not just you know, the, the protagonist is a special case because of her history. But I think ordinary people who, who self and whose family haven't been brutalized by uh, state security robots uh, might also have some concerns about uh, a, a machine of state violence caring for their children. Um, but I... I I, I think there's a distinction to make here. The, the comforting thing is that the, the, the security module, the violent module has been removed from the robot. So technologically, that, that capacity or tendency isn't there. But we look, um, we look now at, uh, for instance, um, uh, I, I think it's Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida uh, that has responded to the teacher shortage in Florida uh, by by saying um, we're going to bring all the, in all these veterans um, who uh, who can then go into the classroom and, and teach kids, and nobody has a problem with that, or uh, it doesn't seem like many people are objecting. What you're bringing uh, uh, agents of state violence in to uh, 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 care for our children, um, and and with the, and with these, and I'm not suggesting that there's anything violent about veterans. Um, uh, but certainly, there's no way of removing the, the violence module um, in, in a, a, a veteran. Um, yeah, if you think of robots as always being kind of analogies for social programming in some way that like there's ro robots are programmed, we're acculturated in certain ways. And so what you're speaking to has to do with the acculturation of veterans and military environments exactly. that they were in when they were quite young. I mean, yeah, and, yeah. And even like not uh, even like not really going that far. Uh, one one of the things I was actually thinking about is always the the you know the motto of like serve and protect, which is very similar to the kind of motto, for instance, we have in in Nigeria for even the Nigerian police, right? Mm -hmm. But then um, a lot of the time when you think about um, you know, I I was actually an adult when I found out that the police actually, for instance, like state um, assigned forces. Um, whether, you know, whatever form they take from police to, you know, um, other forms are actually supposed to care, you know, provide care, aid. I didn't actually know those things, you know. Um, I just had this idea growing up, you know, that 
you know, the police were always just, you know, never there to aid. But then, you know, it, I found out later, I was like, oh, so they're actually supposed to help you. Like if you have a flat tire on the highway, you can like flag down a cruiser. I didn't actually know that. I was like, oh, I didn't know I could do that. I would actually be more scared to do that than otherwise, right? So I, that's part of what I was thinking too. I was like, these are actually, you know, fundamentally, even if whatever form that takes, even if it's um, even, even security, right? Even if not state security, even if it's private security, part of the job in general is always also to provide aid, not just to deter, you know, um, crime or violence or other forms um, um, of illegal activity, right? So, so that's what I was thinking about. I was like, because we always front these parts, right, these aspects of, of protection, protection can also mean aid, care, you know, it can also mean those things. And so that's what these, you know, the, 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 the engineer and the owners of this community center and these droids are thinking about at that time. They're saying it doesn't have to be that. And I know that is the only face you see, but that's the face that you get to see because for some reason that maybe, you know, maybe it enriches some people, maybe it gives it makes them, you know, these security droids more feared and stuff like that. And so they say, well, that's fine if those people want to do that, but we think they can be used for better things, especially if they're helping in all these other ways, right? If they're helping reduce costs for childcare and stuff like that, like we can strip that module off and then we can have this programming that, you know, leaves them with the other good things that we could actually st stick with. Um, and and yeah, this pretty much cuts across, you know, pretty much all, all as you say, Lance, like agents of state violence in a way, because, uh, because because, it's as I you know, it's not always it's not always uh, <laughs> it's not always that uh, violent response is, is the first thing that is you know in all such scenarios, not really. But as I said, I was an adult when I learned that. So how much so many more people who almost not, you know, never even get to learn that. Or even if they do, it never like strips away what they have, you know, and what they have dealt with, right? Traumas or encounters, especially in this case, like the protagonist who is struggling to reconcile the fact that this thing that she has witnessed enact violence in a very specific way that has affected her can also be capable of this other thing um so yeah that's i i, th I think what one of the things that's interesting is 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 that realization that this thing capable of violence can also be capable of good that realization with the with the robot that the protagonist has but there's another character that looms really large in this story and that is the state itself yeah uh, right of, of which the the protagonist is a is an agent um, uh, you know part of the violence and if, uh, we can call it metaphorical violence here is is uh, the the system under which uh, these people are uh, in, in which these people are existing that requires uh, them to uh, improvise and and sort of uh, you know, make up new new models of of doing things that kind of gets around the state a little bit. Uh, 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 finding a way to to cope uh, on the one hand with the exigencies of late stage capitalism uh, in this story, and on the other, uh, uh, state regulations. Um, uh, you know, all in this. Uh, what is clearly a technologized police state may be a bit much, but there are these, these uh, mm -hmm. security robots that are just walking around looking for work. Right. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and not only that, but, but this is a very struggling care center that can't afford to, to run itself without some sort of imp improvising. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's a bind because um, yes, they're using these these bots to be able to keep their their care center approach, but those those robots are replacing human workers 
or at least potential human workers that could be um, uh, employed doing childcare, right? So automation, uh, so part, part of this story mm. is, is about automation um, displacing humans socially and in caregiving, but mm. also economically, right? Which is, mm. which is a very familiar story um, uh, you know, that we're experiencing now and will continue to in the future with robots and automation. Yeah, that, that's so, actually a good point. <laughs> So, so the, the, the state and the system set up by the state, it, it really is a powerful force in this, in this story. Um, there's even, uh, you know, you, you even talk about legislation yeah. um, uh, that's, that's been passed. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, uh, that's, that's one of the things that struck me. So I, can I you... remember like, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead no, 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 please go ahead. And, and then I'll, <laughs> then I'll, I was going to kind of prompt you in a direction, but I bet you'll go in it anyway. So go no, ahead. No, it's fine. Maybe you should prompt me. Then I'll just like fold them together. Okay. Let's have you. Yeah. We'll just have you do like the hardest possible rhetorical <laughs> exercise, but hopefully this will row in the same direction. Um, so yeah, I was going to ask you to talk a little bit more about the piece of legislation. Cause I, when, when you and I were working on the story, um, that was an important and kind of dynamic factor as it developed was like, and, and something I had questions about, where it's just like, you know, there's this child care act that um, looms over the whole story and, and gives some structure to the way that this child care center is being inspected and evaluated. Um, and it has to do with who can do care work, yeah. uh, how many humans you need per child, how many or how many children can, you know, can be in a, in a care setting for the number of human caregivers and, and also who's allowed to care for um, children within a family and, and, um, it gets at exactly what Lance is talking about, the way that like state action sort of puts additional pressure on people, but also sort of structures the kinds of um, childcare arrangements that we can provide. And then additionally, and I'll throw this little last bit in, which is like the way that scientifically complicated insights about and, and, and sort of facts and findings about child development are used, you know, maybe in a good natured way, but maybe also kind of are weaponized yes. to encourage certain kinds of like family arrangements and economic behaviors and then to discourage others. Yes. So, I mean, that's like a lot for you to wrap in, but I'm <laughs> interested in like the, the way you, the way you, you thought that policy played out and maybe again, like how that gets to the background of the story. Cause I know that you had talked about some of your personal experience and places you had lived and places you were familiar with where there was that kind of like, there were those policy pressures. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, so to start, I live in Canada, right? Um, and Canada does have um, um, mostly um, a lot of its social infrastructure for healthcare, childcare, you know, um, even parental care is, is, um, is, is, I would say, really good compared to like a, other many other places I've lived in. And but one of the things I didn't know was that there was actually something very similar to this Child Care Act in, in Ontario specifically, but every province has one. Um, uh, and it actually dictates who can care for whom and what. Um, I mean, not, it doesn't tell you that your family members can't do that, <laughs> which is what this act does um, in the story. But, but that was me just pushing <laughs> the Ontario Act a bit further into dystopian territory. <laughs> um, but but one of the things I didn't know beforehand actually was that there was even such a thing that said, oh, you can't, um, like, you, you, these, are, these are the kinds of people you can hire um, to, to come into your home and care for your child. Um, these are the kinds of community centers and daycares and day homes that you can take children to. This is what they must have before you can run it or else it becomes illegal. You know, so there are all these policies and guidelines, and there's actually an act that governs these things. Um, and I remember uh, Joey and I having this uh, back and forth in the comments of the story where I was like, it's not as far, you know, it's not as far apart in the future as you think. <laughs> Some of it is already existent. Um, and then I was also thinking about the nature of what, you know, this, go we never really get into like what this government is like in the story, but I was, right. I was trying to point out that the more conservative and traditional the government is, the more these policies will sort of um, squeeze 
um, parents and 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 caregivers, givers and and guardians into attempting to keep the traditional family unit, you know, in, in the Western sense as we know it, and in most sense, right? So, um, so if there's an act that's saying you can't have someone who's not the, because that's what the Child Care Act in this story says, you can't have someone who's not the primary caregiver that or like the primary guardian or the parent or a licensed professional care for this child. So pretty much they're saying your sister cannot do it and your mother cannot do it. Um, and I can easily see that being passed if someone is trying to prevent a single family, you know, single parent household, for instance. Yeah. And that's not too far from what some of the stuff we're seeing um, in like the way policies, for instance, and, and community action and is being pushed in various states in the US, even if it seems like it's like focused towards like books and libraries. But if you really think about it, it is um, attempting to influence schooling, which in its, you know, it's it, to influence schools, right? And, and, and education, which in a sense is still childcare, which is still childcare, even if we're not seeing it that way, For but sure. it is. So in a sense, that's actually government action attempting to influence childcare. Um, so it's not that far away for policies that would, you know, point toward <laughs> conservative values to be enacted. And then as Joey says, like, you use the language, right? The pig you piggyback off the language of something that seems you know, legitimate, e.g., you know, the the interactions between uh, young children and technology, because that's something that's, you know, top of every parent's mind. Yeah. How do I, how do I limit my child's usage <laughs> of the internet? Of and, and you know, how much so ha have them just taken care of by like robots all day? You know, I could see someone who has like very conservative traditional values being like repelled by that. Right. So it, it didn't seem too far fetched to me, even if it seems very dystopian, but not so much. Um, and, and I said, as I said, I come from somewhere that's very, you know, conservative and traditional in that sense, even if some of um, a lot of the cultures um, from the African continent consider the family unit to be bigger than, you know, the nuclear family. Um, and so and so that's really why I started thinking about community beyond in that sense. So it's like these people are putting together their resources to sort of build something bigger that still meets, um, that still sort of meets the needs in a sense that you would think of in a bigger family unit without having to be a traditional family unit. And then in the mix of all of this, you still have technology playing a role because in this, right. you know, in this future time, technology does play a role at the center of many things. Like one of the characters points out, it's like this robots are your biggest problem, but you have like teachers that are run by AI or like teaching modules that are run by AI. You have cars that are like driven half by computers and your, your children interact with them. So like, there's no difference between that and robots, right? Yeah. And these machines is the point one of the characters is trying to make. Um, and, but that's also a point I was trying to make the, uh, to the doctor at some point where, um, like I, I was thinking about how every time we go to the doctor, the, the amount of um, engagement with uh, a lot of the technological technological devices that the, um, that our child had to make because they were using that to you know carry out certain activities, to scan, to do this, and they have like the kids interacting with them the whole time. So I'm like, but that's no different from like I know I know of course everyone's like oh no TV it's like turns your brain into warm food or whatever. Um, but it's, it's not a, any, it's not that much different because technology comes in different forms. So I guess, um, like the character was the point the character was making is it's more about balance and that in their, in their view, their community center and day, day home, daycare co-op of a sort does factor that balance in. So it's not like they have the, the children like sitting in front of the robots like 24 seven, you know, and just interacting with them only, right? Um, and, I, and I think that's what sort of also led me to what is the end, right, uh, of the story. Um, this is not a spoiler, but, <laughs> um, but the, the protagonist still believes that that balance can be found within the regulation, but just without caving to the, to the specific need to weaponize the legislation. So they sort of come to a balance, they sort of come to a, they meet in the middle 
in a way where the protagonist is like, okay, I can see the, I can see the value in in how in the original idea behind creating this balance, right, between technological contact and human contact for the children, but without allowing it to be weaponized to derail the aims of this community center, which is to provide this childcare that cannot be found outside of, you know, um, capitalist systems. Uh, like childcare being tied to employment, which is, I mean, that's not so far fetched either. I mean, healthcare is tied to employment, so why not childcare? Um, yeah. <laughs> so. And of course, this legislation uh, is not gender neutral uh, uh, because if, if it's requiring the, uh, the parents or uh, primary guardians to provide the care, um, that is going to fall more often on women uh, than men so that uh, uh, you know women will be uh, performing free labor uh, to maintain um, the states and the and, and industry and, and all that yeah, exactly um, so uh, you know one I, I guess the the notion of um, technology and is it bad for children? Uh, didn't really loom for me much in this story mm -hmm. because all the discourse around, oh, is tech bad for kids is usually around media, right? Uh, like you said, uh, uh, television, uh, uh, screens, basically. Um, but you don't, you don't hear people wondering, oh, is playing with, with drones bad for kids? <laughs> Um, and, and, and the robot, uh, certainly the robots here, they're not media, they're real robots. And so I, I, I didn't really, I didn't really find that, uh, uh, you know, a compelling controversy within the, the story world. Uh, what, what interests me about, oh, should we have robots care for our kids? Um, uh, even if, you know, they have good training, um, you know, and follow appropriate protocol. Uh, you, you know, I'm thinking about Harry Harlow's uh, experiments with the wire mother, you know, a, a psychologist took these infant monkeys away from their, their, uh, their mothers and put them in cages with, with two different fake mothers, one uh, covered by cloth and the other just made of wire. And of course, it was terrible for the baby monkeys. Like, what sick fuck does something like that? But anyway, um, uh, but it, re it, it, it reminds me, pardon my French, uh, it reminds me of, uh, of, of, of that, you know, uh, is, there, is there something lacking in the yeah. robot that, uh, or, or something that is present in the human that cannot be replicated uh, by the robot. And here we come to what really fascinates me. Or one of the things that really fascinates me of the story is, 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 is the relationship between human and robot. So robots for me, in addition to have a kind of dual existence. On the one hand, they're real things in the real world. On the other hand, they are, um, uh, you know, objects in the figures in the cultural imaginary. Um, and, and I think they are more the latter than they are the former. They're more stories, they're more science fiction, they're more theater than they are actual objects in the world. And uh, what they are to me is really a set of narratives and, and of, of actually racialized narratives and, and representations um, that engage concepts of, of humanness and labor and agency all within the context of of capitalism. And I say racialized because it, it, it's very important. Uh, um, from the beginning, uh, uh, in 1920, when Karl Chapek invented this word robot, um, uh, in a play, mind you, uh, robots were slaves. In fact, that's what the word robot means. Yeah. Um, and, and you look at so many uh, uh, robot narratives, and it's, it's always, uh, I say that robots are uh, fantasies 
of ethically immaculate slavery. And uh, uh, so, so I was reminded of how uh, in, 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 in various narratives, robots serve as domestic workers. Uh, the, the sort of classic of this is, uh, is Rosie Robot from the Jetsons, uh, who is even in the way she is rendered, uh, rendered as this kind of uh, black mammy uh, character uh, you know, popularized in, in uh, uh, you know, racist novels like Gone with the Wind and other, and other stuff. Um, so, I, uh, you know, that was, that was one of the things that, that came into my mind is here are these, uh, uh, you know, former soldiers that have been repurposed into domestic care workers. Um, and, and, but, but always with a racialized other, there has been, uh, there's a discourse around, well, but isn't there something lacking in that? Mm -hmm. Don't they lack something that we, the humans have? Um, so I, that was interesting to me. No, that's, a, that's actually an interesting point. Um, and I get, and that's, that's um, so that's, that's one of the things I was thinking about when, when I thought, uh, at least when I was writing it, right, one of the challenges I had was like, the aim of this story is not really like to say something, to say like, this is the right way and this is the wrong way of doing this, because because that's what I found a lot around when it comes to, especially when it starts to become something intimate as much as family and like children are, a lot of what we consider hard science often isn't like even even when it's obvious right even when it presents itself as clear uh, and there's like clear evidence people would still rather default to something that's more you know anecdotal or or community based or because because you know there, there's maybe comfort and intimacy there right um and and that's what i was thinking about i was like i guess it's less about if one approach or the other is right or wrong because so a good example is like where I come from, there's a lot of like, um, like contentious um, interactions, you know, between, you know, folks who are coming with what they consider Western medicine, right, and communities who consider their practices, right, herbal practices and other practices, um, especially when it comes to like how they have raised children, fed children, um, you know, um, helped them develop and and how these two practices sometimes are not in sync they can't even be used together one has to replace the other and so many people are like pushing back on these systems that say um, um oh you can't let your your child do this before this age and stuff like that and they're like no we've always done this this way and it has always worked for us so we're going to keep doing it and so it's I, actually it's that kind of contention i wanted to capture yeah. without actually a given a particular solution because that's not the point of the story the point is that um when legislation right when there is there is a, some sort of governance that begins to require you to do something um and it starts to infiltrate spaces that can be very intimate right in this manner uh, especially when you couple this governance with like capitalistic ends <laughs> it becomes very sort of um and it, it it sort of feels like it's encroaching on something that that is very personal in a way and i think joey and i also had this i think that was why you were like this child care act feels like no one would have accepted it um <laughs> and and i was like perhaps right yeah. but again let's not forget that in this particular story a lot of it seemed like it was pushing towards as i said something very traditional very conservative yeah. uh, like lance said this this so a good example is like this burden is clearly going to fall on women more than anyone else right. and then therefore it means that more women will just have to stop working and maybe that's the aim you know like that doesn't again even that aim doesn't seem too far-fetched it can seem very cartoon mm -hmm. villainy but it doesn't seem too far-fetched for a lot of what, the kind of legislation we're seeing now. especially especially in the late capitalism system where automation is replacing a lot of workers um so 
a mm. lot of the workers that get displaced are, are men and they don't exactly. want to compete That's, with ex women exactly. for the jobs. And so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, those are other angles, right? Let's, so, yeah. let's, let's keep them home, take care yeah. of the kids. Exactly, exactly. It's, well, it, sounds, it sounds very plausible to me. Um, and, and so, yeah. Anyway, that's 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 where I wanted the story to sit in that contention. And so the only resolution we get is actually more of a personal choice. But the overarching system doesn't change. It remains the same because that's how it usually is. The contentious systems, the 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 tensions and everything, they remain the same. But this one person has decided, okay, I'm gonna make this small change in this small place because I can. And that's actually also what happens with the community owners, right? The community leaders are doing the same thing. They're like, okay, the system out there is, you know, difficult, but we are going to build this small thing. Uh, and then this city inspector also is able to enact her own change in a very specific way as well. Uh, and that's kind of what I was really thinking about, how the individual can sort of put, come together to sort of make a communal response, create a communal response to something, you know, more uh, system wide. Yeah, it, um, I mean, so all the stuff you, you two have been talking about, it makes me think actually, so you have something I read in graduate school about Canada, it was about Quebec and about a, a sort of raft of proposed pro-natalist policies that were, you know, in various ways, trying to incentivize larger families, larger nuclear families, and essentially discourage work outside the home for women by providing frequently carrots, like providing social support or money and things like that. I don't know how much of this stuff actually got enacted, but there was like sort of feminist researchers who were who were writing about the mm. resurgence of this. And it was, you know, it was a sort of like, um, like you said, it came from a traditional notion about family and domestic responsibilities. But also what has rung true to me as I've spent more time with the story and as you and I talked about it through revising it was, was the way, and what really stuck with me is the the way that that the story is this kind of science fiction type of story, which is like kind of an intellectual salon. The characters are having this sort of debate back and forth and voicing different perspectives around an issue. And one of the things that happens is each of them is marshalling personal experiences and their sketchy understandings of the science of child development to say, yeah. like, is it okay? You know, like Lance said, are you losing something by having your children surrounded by intelligent social robots instead of a bunch of human uh, workers, even if you could afford it, like is something really lost, um, or is this is this really even a problem at all? And then you know, and that feels very true to life too, where people are selectively deciding on scientific or research based insights, exactly. or even sort of folk <laughs> wisdom about how children grow up, or like what what makes us human, and then yeah. marshalling those pieces of evidence strategically to support different kinds of legislation yep. that might otherwise seem unacceptable or yep. um, troubling. Um, Lance, did you have any other thoughts? If not, I wanted to share. No, I, 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 it, I was just audience. reminded of uh, of the novel uh, Clara and the Sun uh, by Ishiguro, um, which is, you know, all centered around uh, a, a robot friend of a, of a human child. Yeah. Um, um, so I, I wanted to turn to uh, a, a question or two from our from our audience. So. Uh, uh, Joe asks, um, I think to you, Sui, uh, that Lalo, the, the city safety inspector, feels like an interesting character for exploring the regulation of robots and automation. And uh, Joe says, she reminds me of Asimov, Susan, Calvin in a weird way. Do you, do you think you might ever write more stories in this world or using this character? <laughs> do you have further plans for Lalo or the, or the safety no, inspector? Yeah, character? no plans at the moment, but I mean, it's, it sounds interesting to me. And I, I don't, I think it's one of those, you know, this world, right, is one of those that doesn't have any neat answers. And so there's always room for like more stuff. Um, and yeah, I would, you know, I'm a storyteller. If there's an opportunity there, I would jump at it. <laughs> the, uh, Joe also asked, um, and sort of this is a comment paired of the question, very much like me, the way I ask questions, which is saying 50 comments and then asking a question. But um, <laughs> he, here's a technology that can be used for care in the story or used for violence, the robots. So the story, Joe continues, might be arguing that technology is neutral and doesn't really embed any particular political or ethical values. Is that what is being said in the story or, or would, you, would you all kind of interpret it differently? I think that's a good question. I, I would interpret it differently um, in that, well, I don't think it's possible for something that's created, which is what robots are, right? And, and in, you know, tech or intelligence of any sort, 
um, intelligence machines, etc., will always carry the you know the biases of the creator. So like um, neut neutrality is not really an existing thing in that sense. Um, you know, because always depending on like where you're looking at it from. I guess what I'm, I guess what maybe the story is trying to say, or what I'm really thinking about, or what I was thinking about when writing it is that technology is pointed in a direction. I think it's more like that. It's like all, all of these machines, these intelligences are pointed in a direction and then sort of um, for various reasons and to various ends, those parts are put front and center. I think of social media the whole time. I'm like, Social media is really just like a data gathering <laughs> service <laughs> at the <laughs> core. That's what it is. But like, there's this thing that is being pointed as a communal service and, you know, which it also is, it can be more than one thing at a time. But the question is what is being, what is the narrative that's being driven about what this technology is and is for, right? Um, and, you know, you will only hear like someone screaming at the back, you know, probably being tagged a conspiracy theorist. Hey, all your information is out there online. It's being grabbed by one million companies. But like, I mean, we know that, but we still use it anyway. So it's like, I guess that's because like at the core, we have bought into this idea of community and the community does exist too. So it's not like it's a lie. It's there. But what part of the narrative is being centered when we talk about the technology. So that's kind of what I was thinking about when I was thinking about this. I'm like, we have all these things. It's, it's just like the regular police. We know that the police is meant to help you, but depending on where you are from and what you're looking at and the kind of experiences you have, you have a particular version or narrative about what the police does. And, and, and that's what you, you, you roll with, right? That's what you move with. So, right. So in this sense, that's really what I'm thinking about. It's not like the technology in particular is like neutral. It's more of like um, what part of the technology are, are we being, or is being pointed at us, or are we being pointed towards, and and what part is being like smokescreen or yeah. not not centered, right? I'll make two quick points. Uh, no, I don't believe technology, especially high tech, not high high tech, is. Uh, politically innocent or yeah. under control, uh, absolutely not. Um, you know, uh, ideology isn't a vapor. It's always uh, material. It always manifests itself in, in material practices and material things. Um, uh, the second thing is the, this idea of the, the, the police are required to uh, protect and serve. Actually, in the United States, uh, there's a whole um, uh, body of law and, and, and court cases showing that, in fact, they're not. Um, uh, the police are not, in fact, required to, to protect you um, uh, for, for kind of weird uh, yeah. uh, legal reasoning. I think, I think Radio Lab did a show about this. Yeah. Uh, that's probably why I know it, but uh, yeah. Um, just, just that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we have a... Um, Another question. So. Oh, that's great. Another. Oh, another question. Well, Joe, thank you. So, what if you all, if so, you Lance, if we'll we'll give this each like you know 30, 45 seconds to respond to this question, which is probably too short, <laughs> no. and then I'll then I'll put a little cap on the event and just thank everybody who helped us put this together. But I, I mean, the question is actually in dialogue with what you two were just talking about, which is yeah. asking if the story draws a connection between guard labor, such as policing and caregiving. It's tempting to think of policing and nannying as very different, but do they have some things in common in this story? Um, I mean, I think you you two have answered that in a way, yeah. but I I do wonder if you think, um, yeah, I don't know if that if that brings up any new thoughts for you. But that was the last question. But you two started to talk towards it. Um, no, yeah, I think I think that's pretty what Lance said. It's like um, I, I think maybe we always think about like care as central to you know social services right um mm -hmm. whether that takes the form of you know the police or whether that takes the form of you know a professional caregiver but um i guess you know um they have different ends right they have different ends and those ends i think will always prevail as long as they you know benefit the the underpinning of how whatever they are set up for so um so yeah that's me I, I pretty much 
you know, pretty much what we said. <laughs> if I can jump in briefly, and it was one of the last things that we added to the story or that you added, I should say, but you and I talked about it, which is that there's this note in the late in the story that um, we learned that the companies that manufacture these military and policing robots don't really want them reused in this way, or they may not. That in a way it's like stripping away the violent reactive procedures, modules, whatever, um, by these, you know, by these daycare providers, basically, demonstrates that, that these are hackable, uh, demonstrates yep. that there's that, that like they, they perhaps might not be as ironclad as they appear as sort of like battlefield or, uh, you know, law enforcement um, operatives. Yeah. And so there is some sense that like, you know, that introduces a note of antipathy between the, you know, what you call the serve module and the protect module. Mm -hmm. um, and then also gets at something that Lance talked about, like in the very beginning of our conversation, which is the notion of performance and the notion of perception, mm -hmm. uh, human perception of what these robots are for. And, you know, the, the way the robots are, you know, in, in this case, perceived as um, performing care work that really clashes with what, what they're um, what yeah. they're marketed as and what yeah. the company yeah. is trying to position so, them as performing, which is, which is, uh, you know, trying to, you know, punitive work or, uh, yeah, you know, exactly. uh, killing, uh, you know, so that's, enacting violence. That was really my impression of the motives behind the, the company that, that for them, this was, uh, this was bad marketing. Mm -hmm. Uh, this, this made their tough guy, uh, uh, you know, cop soldier, uh, robots uh you know look like sissies who uh who wear aprons um and 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 i use these words quite pointedly because uh these two areas uh child care and soldiering or policing are also gendered and mm -hmm. and if we're starting to understand this the, the state in this fictive world as mm -hmm. as as functioning um not not only in this late stage capitalism sense, but uh, and and in a conservative sense, but in a very patriarchal sense. Yep. Uh, this, uh, you know, they don't want their high tech uh, uh, seeming maternal, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, that's bad for for business. It's going to be harder to sell to the to the army, to, to police forces, uh, you know, on the international, uh, um, you know, military market, uh, if, if, if we see them, uh, yeah, wearing an ape. That's care bots. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Well, I have to, I have to kind of curtail us there and ha have us wrap up. Um, right. Thank you so much, Lance and, and Sui for taking the time to be with us today. And so you thank you so much for writing Sympathy. Um, for those of you who, who haven't read it yet, you can check it out at csi.asu.edu slash us in flux. You can read all our other stories there too. Um, I just want to quickly shout out places people can find uh, more about the two of you. So you can find uh, more about Sui and his work at suidavies.com and follow on Twitter at suidavies. These ones are really easy this time. So you can learn more about Lance and his work at lancegaravi.com and follow him on Twitter at Lance Garavi. And finally, um, you can follow um, the Center for Science and the Imagination on Twitter. And that's another way to get announcements about us and Flux Stories and other publications and events at uh, Imagination ASU. And I wanna, before I close, thank everyone at the Center for their support and collaboration and making this event possible. And um, also thank uh, Jonas Martinson who provided uh, some funding that allowed us to do this 2022 season of Us in Flux stories and events. So thank you, John. And uh, we'll be back in September with a with a final story in this um, summer series by Elsa Sienison. And uh, thank you so much to all of you for joining us, including our special guests, and for your great questions and comments. And I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. It was great seeing everyone. Bye. Thanks, Charlie.